Um, so the Heartwood Preserve is the first conservation cemetery within a nature preserve in the Tampa Bay area. So they conserve and permanently protect the endangered natural habitats by providing environmentally friendly uh, burial options. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, Laura will tell us the story of the preserve, give an overview of the uh, land's history and management, and discuss the importance of fire ecology to the overall health of the preserve. Um, Laura herself is a third generation Floridian, born to a cattle ranching family and raised in the very land that the Hartwood Preserve now occupies. She holds a BA in music from Maryville College in Tennessee and an MA in applied linguistics uh, from USF Tampa. Um, in 2004, she left teaching uh, to join her father's um, eco tour business at the Starkey Flatwoods Adventures. Um, and in 2006, she became the director of conservation lands, managing over a thousand acres of woods on the Starkey Ranch. Um, during this time, she developed a keen interest in finding ways to conserve natural lands while sharing the beauty of Florida's woods with the residents and visitors. Um, over the next few years, this seed sprouted into a business plan and eventually the idea of the Heartwood Preserve became a reality. So Laura, I will make sure that you are able to share your screen and I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Davis. Can everybody hear me okay? I guess thumbs up if you can, if, okay. <laughs> Okay, very good. Uh, give me a minute here to get my screen shared. And I'm going to, I'm just going to take you through some slides just because so you don't have to just look at my face talking for the next half hour or so. Um, but also just to give you some images of Hartwood Preserve. I'm really hoping that all of you or at least a good bit of you uh, will come out on Saturday and walk around. There is really nothing like seeing the place to really understand what we're doing out there. And it's just going to be a beautiful Saturday. So uh, hopefully, hopefully to see all of your uh, actual faces um, in a few days. So I'm going to uh, do the screen share. Give me a minute here. Make sure I'm good. Share. All right. So here's my little slideshow. Okay. So Hartwood Preserve. Yeah, we, as, as Davis mentioned in the introduction. We are the first and only conservation cemetery really south of, of uh, Gainesville. There's one up outside of Gainesville called Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery. They've been around, they've been open for a few more years than, than we have. And so, and they were very helpful uh, helping us uh, learn the ropes as we got started and getting, getting to the point of being open. Uh, so I, I appreciate them. If anyone's up in that area, I highly recommend visiting Prairie Creek. They're a part of the Alachua Conservation Trust, um, land trust area up there outside of Gainesville. But Hartwood, again, we opened in uh, 2016, the last month of 20, or November of 2016. And um, it's about 41 acres. Uh, when you come out on Saturday, you'll get to see a lot of it. Uh, but I wanna first start talking about what what we do, what we're doing out there in terms of the cemetery portion. So we're uh, what we call a conservation cemetery, and a lot of you may have, some of you may have heard about green burial, different green burial options out there, and uh, wanted to talk about the what what green or natural burial is. I use the term natural burial more so than green burial, just because I feel like the term green is so overused and it's not as not as descriptive uh, anymore as, as it could be. So I just because I feel like it's just kind of overused. Uh, I'll talk about that here in a minute. So green burial, though, since that's kind of uh, what a lot of people like to use um, in that terminology. Basically, what we're talking about is the process of the, the way we do a burial, um, which in this case for green burial, there is no embalming of the body. There is no concrete vault or grave liner buried in the ground. Uh, the, the burial container, the casket or the shroud uh, is all biodegradable. So it can be a simple pine box casket. Um, it can be a shroud. We just had a burial today with a beautiful cotton shroud. Um, then it can also be an urn if, because we also bury cremated remains. And so we have some beautiful urns that are all natural biodegradable. Basically, if any of you are Jewish, you may be like, yeah, we've been doing this for 3000 years. This is a very traditional uh, way to burial, bury 
the dead. Uh, and again, in the Jewish tradition, very much, um, very much the same as green burial. Um, it also includes the sustainable management of land. So, um, so it's not going to be what you see in a typical um, modern conventional cemetery. Then we have another level uh, of the next level of, of that we would call the natural cemetery. So basically, you're using all of those green burial practices, no embalming, no vault, you know, all natural things. Uh, and then we're setting it within a nature preserve or a park-like setting. So this, you're also helping to protect or restore this, this, the system, the ecosystem. There's very little, uh, you don't see big headstones. There's minimal amount of memorializing on the grave site. Uh, so anything that goes on the grave is, is natural. It's either a natural stone, if it's, there's natural stone in that area or um, uh, something very minimal. Uh, and then we also have a very low density of graves. That means we're not putting shoulder to shoulder, um, you know, grave, you know, max, you know, packing them in the way you would in a in a modern or regular cemetery. So we're really spreading them out um, so that we're not having over impact uh, of the graves over time. And then conservation burial is sort of like I like to think of it as sort of the, the platinum level of of green burial, where you're you're doing all of the things above that I just mentioned, but then we're also um, adding on a, a long-term lasting environmental legacy here. So that's basically, we've got uh, a conservation cemetery is gonna have green burial in a natural na nature preserve setting, uh, using best management practices for you know, taking care of the land. And then there's also the being part of a bigger conservation um, intention with whether for our case we are we border this the 18,000 acre Starkey Wilderness Preserve uh, so we even though we're only 41 acres altogether we were we're across the fence from from that larger uh, conservation uh, per permanently protected uh, preserve so we're an extension of that if you're you know versus being uh, little small pockets is, um, of conservation are not as not as valuable as being connected to a bigger piece. Uh, and then having a conservation easement or some other type of uh, document that, that makes sure that future owners of that cemetery will continue to do the same conservation, conservation of the land. So basically you're, you're really having a farther impact with your, with your burials. So by definition, all the things that I just described, they're safe, they're all legal, everything. We are fully licensed by the state of Florida um, very, uh, cemetery. Uh, everything's biodegradable, it's environmentally sustainable, simple, natural, affordable. It tends to be more affordable because you're not paying for embalming. That's a service that costs some money, um, could be up to $1,000 or more just for the embalming. There's um, a lot of cemeteries you pay for the a casket, which is often very expensive, uh, as many of you may know, if you've ever had to bury someone and purchase a casket. Um, and then the vault, sometimes they make you pay for the vault too, and that's expensive. So the whole thing, and then a headstone, it just goes on and on. So, but so it tends to be more affordable. We don't really market ours as, or promote it as, hey, it's your cheap option for burial, but it tends to be much less expensive. But the, Beyond that, that what I find, what I have found as I've learned to do this is that, you know, this is, you're really becoming, all of those things are great. They check off our list of environmental vision, um, values that we all hold, you know, at least everyone in this room does. And a lot of people really hold these environmental uh, values uh, close to our heart and live our lives this way. Uh, but then also, this is your, yourself, you're giving your body to become something bigger after you're gone. So you're becoming part of an ecosystem. You're literally, literally joining in the conservation of this land. So, you know, with, with the burials, they tend to be, you know, very um, hands-on. Here's, here's our burial crew and the funeral director. Uh, taking a, a natural casket out. You can see this one's made out of wicker. It's so it's readily biodegradable. Uh, so there's some beautiful products out there. We do a lot of just simple pine box caskets in the traditional sense, but then there are a lot that are, you know, like more decorative, like this one is just lovely. 
but very, um, very much a green casket. And the other thing that's that's really been interesting as I've started with Heartwood um, with this idea, and I'll talk a little bit about why I why I came up with doing this. But what I discovered is that the, the day of the burial, I have family members that are still scratching their head that why did you decide to start a cemetery? You're around death all the time. Good grief, Laura, you're the most sensitive person in our family. You're going to just, you're going to die from sadness. And, you know, it. we do have sad days there, but these burial days we're providing an opportunity for these families to say goodbye to their loved one in this most beautiful place. Look at this. I mean, this was a gorgeous day. This family was, you can see over here where the, uh, these are the daughters and they were burying their mother. And she was a self-described old flower child hippie. And she, you know, had come to us and, and pre-planned and, um, and then, I don't know, six or eight months later, she passed away. And so uh, the family wanted everyone to wear bright colors. So you'll see we're all wearing bright cl colors here for this, that this is our burial crew. Uh, so we all wore bright clothes if we had them and we're walking through the woods. There's a path here. It looks like we're tromping through palmettos, but we're, we're walking through a pathway. But you can see the daughter here is holding a, an iPhone. She's playing a song that her mother requested for the walk to her grave, which is Fat Bottom Girls by Queen. So if any of you know that one, I got such a kick out of us walking very somberly out here and the family was playing that song in her mom's honor. And so there was, you know, a lot of tears, but also some, some, you know, big relief from these families that are just, they just feel relieved to have a place that is peaceful and they don't walk out to visit and think of cemetery, death, oh, it's so depressing. If they come out and there's birds flying around and there's wildflowers blooming. And, you know, there's, we have, you know, just, there's a lot going on that's, that's about life. Here you can see some, I just want, it's, it's important, I think, to see some images of what this looks like when we have a burial. This is, this is the same, same lady and she uh, requested to be buried in a shroud. So you can see it looks kind of like a cotton sheet. It may very well be just a cotton sheet off the bed. So it can literally be a sheet off the bed. Uh, it can be a handmade, beautiful, you know, specifically to be a shroud. Uh, it can be um, a quilt. Um, we've had a lady buried in a, wrapped in a quilt that she was a quilter. And so she wanted to be, you know, wrapped in this quilt. And um, my mom, who's a quilter, has requested that she's going to do the same when she, when it's her time. When we open the grave, we, we open the grave and, and unlike at modern conventional cemeteries, they, if you've been to any graveside services, they take away the dirt. They don't want you to see the dirt. This is cover, if they do have it here, they cover it in AstroTurf. They slide, they put AstroTurf along the side down like this. They don't want you to see the dirt down below. The body's already placed in a big casket that covers up most of the hole and there's an automatic lowering device and they really feel like it's not good to see what's happening here and they usually escort the family away before the crew comes uh, and lowers them down and the machine comes and pushes that dirt back in. Uh, very different with a natural burial. It's much more like what people used to do or people do traditionally in other parts of the world still. Basically, we, um, you can see the ropes across uh, the boards across the grave here. The body is laid here. I think if we go up, you can see where she's laying across the open grave here. And then we have the ropes here that are laid across and then we hand lower the body into the grave when the family's ready. The dirt over here is just laid off. We try to separate out when we open it. We do open it with the, with the backhoe. Um, a lot of natural cemeteries open the whole thing by hand, which um, my hat's off to them, but we do have a, a machine that opens our graves. Um, and then we close the grave by hand. We invite the family to take a shovel and be part of that if they wish, which sometimes is really helpful for the family. We've had burials where all of the brothers of a young man, they were all EMTs and firefighters and they they took the shovels from us and just closed the whole thing. They just, they were gonna take care of their brother. So 
Uh, so if we're invited, but if they don't, other people are like, no, we're good. No, let's put a little dirt in there. We're heading back out or we're going to stand back here because they're just, it's upsetting, you know, to, to bury someone, their loved one. So we close the grave by hand. Um, so this takes about 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then once we do that, we cover it with pine straw. And here you see, we've got natural, you know, wildflowers we collected on site. We do have some cut flowers. People do bring uh, cut floral flowers, which is um, fine as long as there's, we tell them at the beginning, no roots, no seeds, don't bring any seeds from the outside, nothing artificial, um, nothing dyed, just everything, you know, natural. And then we have wildflower seeds. I collect, I have, we either collect them on site during, uh, during the fall and keep a collection of wildflower seeds, or we often don't have enough. And so we'll, we'll order some from the Florida Wildflower Seed Cooperative up near Gainesville. Um, a regular order of, I buy them by the pound or two of, of seeds um, that are the packet of seeds that are a mixture of um, seeds for this ecosystem. We also do, the as I mentioned earlier, the burial of cremated remains. Uh, and the family can either pour the ashes directly into the grave or they can place, place them in a biodegradable urn and, and bury it, as I mentioned. But again, I, I wanna also talk about all the other things that we do that are not just about the cemetery. The part that is, you know, if you go back to our front entrance sign, it says nature preserve and conservation cemetery. So we're not just a cemetery, we are a nature preserve. And as other some other nature preserves do, I know Brooker Creek has amazing programs and a lot of other um, preserves do as well. Um, we have volunteer days. This is a group that was planting a wildflower, native wildflower garden. Um, West Pasco Audubon uh, hosts birding walks every so often early in the morning. We have a meditation, a sitting meditation group that meets once a month that we host and um, and we even had a wedding. I'm so happy that we had a wedding here. This was actually, it looks such a great picture. It looks to me like something out of a wedding magazine, but this was a young couple that loved it out there and um, and they asked if they could rent it for their wedding. So they we had a small wedding uh, under our big oak tree behind the building and um, it was just lovely. So it's a very much of a place of life um, and we have, while there is a lot of sadness on the days of the burial, um, there is just a lot of joy as well. So just that's that's really a, a, a quick run through of what natural burial is about, what Heartwood Preserve does and how what it looks like in terms of the burials in the cemetery and the community we're building. Um, but I just wanna talk a little bit now about the land that we're, we're on. So uh, as, as was mentioned in the bio, I, I grew up on this land. This was the far other, the far western end of, of the ranch that I, I grew up as a little girl, you know, running around riding horses as I got big enough to ride, hop on the back of a horse and um, learn how to drive an old Jeep with stick shift and no brakes um, when I was 13 and, and rode around. Um, and just so this, this is land that I have. I have grown up in and I love it so dearly that um, I really wanted to figure out how can I, how can we hold on to a few more acres of the woods? Um, our family's history goes back to the 1930s in Pasco County, back to the late 1800s in Pinellas County. Um, so, so I'm deeply connected to this land and personally and as a family. So over time, as you all know, in Pinellas County, all the work that you're doing there, you know that you're a landlocked county that has been pressured by development and taken over by development over the years. My grandfather, who had you know raised his family in Pinellas County, grew up in Pinellas County, which was then still Hillsborough County at the very beginning. Um, he saw that that pressure was going to be coming up, just headed north, uh, right up the coast to Pasco County. So he knew that there were going to be pressures on our family, his you know, younger generations of his family, to to develop. So he did a purchase, did a sale of the half top half of the ranch, which was sixteen thousand acres. Uh, he sold half of it, close to eight thousand acres of it, to Swift Mud. 
and with a donation of a few hundred acres to Pasco County for a park facility. And that became the Starkey Wilderness, J.B. Starkey Wilderness Park. The, then after he passed away, we sold another quarter of the remain, half of the remaining ranch, another quarter of the original ranch we sold uh, to, to Swift Mud also to pay off his estate tax and, and it became part of the Starkey Wilderness Preserve. It was a win-win-win. We got to pay off the taxes, the land got protected and, um, and yeah, it, there, it was, it was great. The public got, got this bigger, bigger piece of land. So that's the, the, the Starkey Wilderness Preserve. Uh, this again, this is a little, we did develop the a couple thousand of the original 16,000 acres, um, less than probably around 80% was conserved and the less than 20% got developed uh, into what's now called Starkey Ranch, the community Starkey Ranch, not to be confused with the actual ranch that I grew up on. Uh, so it's not a ranch anymore, but it's named Starkey Ranch. So this is a corner of that because we did that, that development I was able to um, take on making this project happen. So one of the challenges of what where Hartwood is and what our family faced and what you all are keenly aware of living in Pinellas County, kind of as I mentioned, you know, this is the landlocked Pinellas County Peninsula. Um, this is a this is a chart I got off of. Um, Oh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council website, I think, at some point. But this uh, this is the projected growth. This is if we do it in a clustered sort of format. So this is one of the, one scenario of projected growth. But I've got this just to just to show you um, just the green or the protected green you know, swaths. Here's Brooker Creek, Starkey Wilderness Preserve. Um, this is all State Road 54 corridor, which is exploding as we speak. Um, Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete, you get the picture. Uh, so Hartwood is right here. And this is literally, we are so much the, what's called the wildland urban interface. That's a term that's used a lot in land management and, and land conservation world um, is the wildland urban interface. So we are the interface. So like in such a, on the picture of the big map, but also just on a day-to-day -day basis. We, if you look out that window, you see Starkey Wilderness Preserve. You look out that window, cars are streaming by on Starkey Boulevard, heading down to 54, which is all of this purple. So here we are on this, on this urban interface. Uh, so what we have is this opportunity. So this opportunity to uh, engage the community in a way that um, helps protect the land. So when I learned about when I learned about the idea of a conservation cemetery, I was at a land conservation convention up in uh, Nashville, I think that year. So the Land Trust Alliance is this big national international land conservation organization. So a workshop was on green conservation burial grounds, and I was really intrigued with that. So that's how I first heard about it. Um, and so any of you, as like you're look, I'm looking at your fundraising to save Klosterman Preserve and the different projects that you all have been part of with saving what little pieces of remaining conservation areas uh, exist. Uh, as you know, it takes money to do that. Even if you buy the land, it takes money to take care of it. You can't just buy it close the gate, turn, lock the key and walk away from it and say, oh, we did that, we protected it. Well, it takes money. It takes money to pay for land management, uh, for managing invasive species. You all know this. Uh, also for doing control burns. We're in an area that needs to do control burns in order to continue um, taking care of the land. So in order to do that, you have to have some type of funding mechanism to do that. That's why a lot of you know, having the state or the county or the, you know, federal government in some bigger cases purchase land for conservation because they have a funding mechanism to take care of it. Uh, so for private land conservation, the challenge is how do you pay for it? So when I learned about this, I thought this is an interesting way that can, you know, the purchase of a burial space can help take care of the land. So it's an opportunity for for us to take care of this, this one little more check, chunk of woods, but also something that 
provides a service, provides a place, provides an option for something that everybody's facing. We're all going to die. You know, nobody wants to really talk about it, but every one of us right here is going to not be here in so many years. So what's going to happen after we die? So everybody, everybody faces death. So this is something that gives people an option. You've got, you know, big headstones and opportunities for embalming and vaults and all of those things, or there's cremation. And then what you, will you do with the ashes? You can throw them in the Gulf, uh, sprinkle them in the mountains or in your backyard, whatever. That's great uh, to have those options, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you, you know, so um, this just gives us another option. So when I learned all about that, I just felt such a um, uh, excitement. I don't know if that's the right word, but a sense of you know, mission, a sense of feeling like this is, this is something I should do. This is something that I have an opportunity to do this. Who's got this opportunity around here? You know, I've already got access to this land that's frankly quite expensive based on where we are. Um, and, but I have an opportunity. This is land that I grew up on. I have access to purchasing it and an ability to do this. So, and I have a drive and an interest and, and, and so I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. So I keep saying I, but I did have a lot of help along the way, so I cannot take all the credit. So as I mentioned, control burns, this ecosystem of, uh, this is a longleaf pine flatwoods ecosystem. Here's the longleaf pine. As you see, uh, many of you may know about the ecosystem. We're gonna go walk around these areas on Saturday and just really look at it and learn more about this. Um, or if you already know about it, um, we're going to share what we know and we're going to uh, learn and just discover some more things if we can. So with, with the longleaf pine, as you see here, it has no lower branches. The few lower branches that are still here are kind of broken off. They look like they, they're just basically shedding their lower branches. And that's because it's ready, it's prepared and able to survive fire. And so that's one of the many, many fabulous things about control burns about, I should say about fire on this landscape. So what we are doing to keep these woods conserved and to keep these woods healthy is continuing to do control burns. I am just had my 11th year of being a prescribed burn manager for the state of Florida forestry. And uh, it's one of my favorite jobs in the world is setting the woods on fire. It's just a beautiful day. It's a beautiful, hard, difficult day. And then after we're done, we have this amazing abundant wildflowers that come back and we have trees that grow that no other trees can grow like them, that we have wild uh, wire grass that does not go to bloom until we have fire. And I walk through the woods and sweep the wildflower, the wire, wire grass seed heads and say, you're welcome, you're welcome because we burned you last summer and now you're going to seed. So it's a really, um, it's an exciting, invigorating thing. Uh, so here are some of the different plants and wildflowers that we see. Um, one native plant society, I think he's a Tampa chapter, um, came out and discovered this giant orchid here. It's actually small, but it's called a giant orchid. Probably most of you know it already, but I learned about it when he found it. And in the picture, it looks giant, but I was really excited about that. Of course, we have lots of blazing star, Leatris. Uh, this is some prickly pear. So I, but in kind of in conclusion about this is that, you know, this is something that was said um, for a, an, an article that was written about us by a man whose son had died uh, five years before he had his ashes. And he, you know, he just was grieving and for five years. And, um, and I'm sure he's still grieving because, you know, grieving is, it just takes its time. It just takes its time on you. And, but when he came out here and he found this place, he felt like this is that he finally found where he could bring Greg, his son. And so he, he placed him here, and uh, this was the most poignant thing I've I've heard. That you know he was 100% of the time in grief and mourning, and this gave him an opportunity to finally start finding some peace. So um, that to me is, you know, I love these woods. You'll see it. You can see it as I talk about the trees and about putting fire on the landscape. 
you'll see it when we're out here, you'll see why I love it. But this right here is just, you know, is um, a, a joy and a surprise that I did not expect when I did this. Oh, I get teared up. Um, so I just want to um, thank you for listening and I'm gonna open up for, for questions. Here are just some of the res resources that I use that I quoted in some of these, just I think it's important to quote our sources. The Conservation Burial Alliance is an organization that just started up a couple of years ago. I'm on the board of it. That's uh, of conservation burial group organizations around the country. And we provide resources for people who are wanting to start a conservation cemetery and those that are already practitioners to just kind of help support each other. The Green Burial Council is an organization that set the standards for green burial. Uh, and then of course us and Prairie Creek, our good friends up there in Gainesville. So I hope you all will come on Saturday to, um, I'm gonna stop the sharing here's, but here's the, here's the um, address, but come on Saturday to the field trip. We're gonna have a nice morning and I'll have coffee. I'll get a pot of coffee going and we'll um, have some nice walk around and, and um, have a nice, nice morning. So again, let me take out the stop share and that's it. So any questions, did any questions come up? Uh, yeah, I think I've got a couple. Um, first of all, thank you, Laura. That was wonderful. Um, I think that's such a cool thing. Um, you know, it, it's never a fun topic to bring up. And I know personally, I've, I've dealt with uh, a few um, hard times, but uh, especially people like us that are, you know, wanting to learn and they're very uh, native plant minded and, and uh um, environmentally conscious. I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to be able to, to provide to people. Um, okay. Well, let's see. I had one question, uh, from where's my chat. Here it is. Um, had one question from Rich and Peggy. They say, uh, we like to travel. If we pre-planned our burials and are not nearby when we pass, is there any reciprocal agreement with conservation cemeteries in other parts of the country? Um, that's a great question. A lot of people have, a number of people have asked us that because, you know, of course, in Florida, we have a lot of people who are snowbirds, um, but a lot of people just love to travel. Um, so right now we don't have anything. I know a lot of, you know, mainstream cemeteries that are corporately owned, they have those kind of programs because there's just so many of them around and they can do that. Um, at some point, we probably like on a case by case basis, say, for example, if someone you know, lives in Ohio part of the year. There are two conservation cemeteries in Ohio that, you know, we're both, we're all on Conservation Burial Alliance. I'm sure we would work, we could work something out. We haven't gotten to it yet because honestly, this is, there's just so few of us still, but increasing numbers, it's not easy to get these things going. So, and to do it in a right and sustainable way, it takes a lot. And so, it's, it's slow to get more around, but as the, as the movement grows, as the number of burial uh, burial grounds or cemeteries grow, um, then we will hopefully be able to do that. So it, right now it'd just be sort of hit or miss and let's see what we can work out. Um, I hope that's helpful. Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the, in the chat, we'll go over them. Um, I did have uh, one email in question from Nancy McClellan. Um, she asks, will you offer natural organic reduction or human composting in the future? Yeah, so you know that some of you may have heard anything about this uh, going through maybe a New York Times article or, or some things going through the internet about Recom, I think it's called Recompose is the name of the, the company or organization out in the Northwest. Um, but basically it's using technology that agriculture um, uses to dispose of, of animal carcasses. So it's not new technology. It's actually a practice that has been used commonly in agriculture. So, but they're now looking at, we're working on, working on doing that for human, human bodies. Um, what basically, no, we're not planning to do that because what we're doing is something that's just so simple of we're putting the body right into the ground and letting nature just do it itself. If we were in a setting where we were, I think where the recompose that uh, human composting 
is going to have a better role is in like a high end dense dense urban uh, setting where you don't have access to the land or you've got so many people you have such a high number of people that uh, it would be a way to then like what do you do with the composted soil do you then put it on top of our ecosystem like we wouldn't want to put so like we wouldn't put any other composting soil out onto the flatwoods so that's what we're doing here is flatwoods like conserving what's already here so composting it would be kind of like well let's find another let's, let's find a use for that compost like maybe for a garden or for a place that's doing that i don't know if this is makes sense i'm not I don't know if I'm articulating it well, but what we're doing is conserving an intact ecosystem. And so in the same way, we wouldn't take gardening compost, you know, of your in your backyard, you know, vegetable waste uh, composted. We don't go put it on our ecosystem. We're just keeping the ecosystem healthy to do its own thing. And the bodies go into the ground and they let nature do its own biodegradation. So, um, yeah, so I think there's a role for that. It's a really interesting and exciting um, technology that's being brought into the human realm, but um, but it's kind of not needed in what we're doing. I don't know if that answers that well. So, okay, um, and we've got another question from Deborah. Um, she asks, with no embalming, how soon after passing do people have to be buried? Well, I'll tell you, and not as soon as you think. Um, by law, um, the body is needs to be put under refrigeration within 24 hours of death. Obviously, not always you can do that. Sometimes the body is not discovered for different reasons. But um, but just generally, the body, whether you embalm or not, they first the first thing they do is put you in in the cooler. So to to slow down the the natural process. Uh, with so when you're in the in the cooler refrigeration, the body does not does not begin to dig, it just slows it down dramatically. So basically, I will say we've had um, burials that have been delayed, you know, a week or two. Typically, or we tell people don't feel like you need to be in a hurry. We do have refrigeration. You know, back when uh, the tradition was set for sundown of the day after the burial, um, that that was back when there was no refrigeration and and the process starts right away. So, um, but with, with modern day refrigeration, um, I will tell you, we're going to have a burial. I won't get into the details of it, but a burial that is actually maybe five or six weeks after this is the longest we've had one since the time of the death, because they were waiting for family members to, to be able to come together and just their situation was such that they have delayed it and they've got, and they're going to do it, but it's, you know, it's fine, you know, just it'll just be under refrigeration or cooling. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'll give uh, anyone a few uh, a few more seconds to post any questions. Um, I did want to mention something since you uh, since you brought that up that on a different note that there actually was a wedding held at the preserve. Um, <laughs> would you be the one to talk to for that? Because I'm actually uh, we're actually in the process of, of planning our own wedding. My fiance. Absolutely. And I, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah, we would love to talk to you about that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I see the, I see the comment from Jan Allen. I treasure my Starkey Flatwoods t-shirt with the DK Flatwoods design. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> Which the, uh, I have to say the license plate reminds me of, of that um, DK Flatwoods. DK Flatwoods is a camouflage design that was designed by Dale and Kim, who would, Kim was the Land, the ranch foreman at dark at our ranch for years and dale was my brother's buddy from childhood they hunted together the two men would uh, hunt out on the ranch and there was no camouflage for florida flatwoods so these two rough and tumble big old guys they designed textile of of a flatwoods um camouflage and so when we had our eco tour operation my dad's operation of flatwoods um, all of the staff wore uh, t-shirts made out of that pattern. So I'm glad to see you have that. So come to this, come to the thing on Saturday and wear your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Laura. Um, we appreciate it. Hopefully uh, everyone got uh, some good information. Hopefully everyone uh, found it interesting, certainly as interesting as I did. Um, again, the field trip will be this Saturday. 
um, starting at 9, uh, 9 a.m. So if you guys are interested uh, to come out, uh, again, there are links in our newsletter, on our Facebook page, uh, as well as on our website uh, on, the, uh, on the calendar. So you guys still have time to join. Yeah, and if I can just make a comment about the field trip, I, this, this presentation was heavy on talking about the cemetery um, because I just, and I have pictures of that I could show you, but I do wanna say, um, we'll probably do more just talking and walking around through the woods and looking at flowers and shrubs and wire grass that's blooming and things like that. So don't feel like we're gonna be all like doom and gloom about the cemetery. I mean, you will see, you know, and some of y'all may want to see some of the, you know, the cemetery areas and, and we could be that be part of it, but it's not going to be as much talking about the cemetery. We'll touch on it, but, and walk around a bit, but there's a lot more to see than just that. So it will be a nice, it'll just be a nice walk through the woods. Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Laura and um, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday evening and we hope to see you out on Saturday. Thanks for having me, everybody. See you Saturday. Good night, everyone. Good night.